Welcome. Um, so tonight we have the last in what I think has been a really informative lecture series. And uh, we're particularly privileged tonight to have as our last speaker um, our professor of economics here at the University of Montana for many years, now emeritus. Um, and I would like to say also a good friend of mine. Um, yeah. and, uh, Professor Barrett is also a senator from Montana, uh, from Missoula. And so, as I mentioned to you before, this was the time when he could uh, be available because he had to wait until the legislative session was over. Um, Professor Barrett um, has taught economics from 1970 to 2007. His undergraduate degree is from Swarthmore College, his doctorate from the University of Wisconsin. He was a Peace Corps volunteer in Columbia from 1964 to 1966. And while he was at the university, he spent several years teaching and doing research in Mexico, Peru, and Uruguay. After retiring, he joined the board of Missoula Medical Aid and has led several Missoula-based medical brigades on trips to Honduras. He's been active in various nonprofit labor, political, and environmental organizations and is currently a member of the Montana Legislature. His topic tonight is Community-Based Medical Assistance, the work of Missoula Medical Aid in Honduras. That's Barrett. Thank you, Lou. I guess I need to turn this on. There. Is that better? Can you hear me a little better that way? Yeah. I uh, taught in this room lots of times, and I'm used to the idea that people hide in the back of the room. And all I do is I just chase you down. I'm just going to come after you. So you can't, you can run, but you can't hide. Uh, yeah, the, I do want to talk to, the only thing I have to do is go back to change my slides. So I'm going to be running back and forth. I'm going to drive the MCAT guy crazy. Um, but I do, uh, I am going to be talking tonight about Missoula Medical Aid. Um, and I uh, emphasize the idea that it's a community-based organization that provides health and a variety of other kinds of assistance um, to Honduras. Uh, and what I'm going to try and do here is kind of give you a primer, if you wish. Imagine that you were wanting to start an organization like this on your, on your own. Uh, suppose that you end up somewhere where you decide, you, well, it'd be kind of nice to have a, an organization like this. I think I'll start one. Uh, what would it be involved? I mean, what? How does such an organization evolve? What are the issues that it has to deal with? Um, what's it like? Um, what are the questions that we've ended up asking ourselves? What do we think we've accomplished? Um, what do we think we need to do to overcome problems and so forth? So how it all started, it started with Hurricane Mitch in 1998. And you may or may not remember Hurricane Mitch, but if you don't, this is a satellite image of Hurricane Mitch. You can see it's enormous, and here's Honduras, completely enveloped in the hurricane. Uh, this hurricane is probably, in terms, in relative to Honduras, more severe than anything we've seen, say, with uh, uh, Katrina or anything. Uh, killed 5,000 people in Honduras. Caused um, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars worth of property damage made a lot of people sick. It was a, a genuine uh, crisis. Um, and there were a group of uh, nurses at Nightingale Nursing, that worked for Nightingale Nursing here in Missoula, who were watching on the TV and reading in the paper about this and said, we thought we ought to do something about this. And they went to their boss, and their, uh, that's a guy named Bill Woody, who is still active in Missoula Medical, and said, can we go to Honduras? And he said, yeah, sure, go. Help pay their way, and they went. Just went, got off the plane, 
and said, we're here, you know, we're going to find some place to work. So the initial, uh, uh, then the initial uh, uh, activity of, of Missoula Medical Aid was that kind of crisis response. That was the original impetus for it. So it all started in that way. Uh, since then, it's evolved uh, quite a bit. Um, I'm going to say this, you'll hear me say this, in Missoula-based or community-based quite a bit uh, as we go along here, because among the kinds of groups that provide this kind of medical assistance um, to in, in, in areas like Honduras, Missoula Medical Aid is relatively unusual in being a based in a community. Uh, you run into in Honduras lots and lots of organizations that are providing some kind of assistance, but usually they're associated with a church or a professional school or a professional association or something of that sort. In this case, um, it's, it's a Missoula-based organization. It draws on Missoula resources. Almost all the volunteers come from Missoula. Uh, and I'll talk more about that um, as we go along. But uh, this organization is strongly identified with Missoula as a place. And then, of course, with Honduras as a place. So what do we do? Um, and this is just an outline uh, at this point. We send three medical teams to Honduras every year. And those medical teams work in providing kind of primary care and health screening in uh, isolated communities, rural communities. And then um, they also, we also send teams of specialists that work in small, fairly simple, fairly basic uh, rural, uh, uh, regional hospitals. Um, we, uh, another important aspect of what we do is we uh, donate medicines and supplies to various rural health providers, uh, some kind of medical worker, maybe a, a, a public health nurse that lives in a, in a remote area or uh, someone who is uh, minimally trained but nevertheless trained to some degree. Uh, we provide medicines and supplies to those workers and to schools, which are often the focal point for organization in these communities. Uh, and um, we also, over the years, have branched out to support programs for sustainable agricultural development, um, nutrition, and I say environmental health, I mean particularly home environmental health, and I'll, I'll have more to say about that in a bit. Um, critically, and I'm going to talk about this too in more, in more detail as we go along, I'm just trying to kind of outline the basics here. We work with Honduran partners, and those relationships are extremely important. If you're going to start your own Missoula Medical Aid, you've got to figure out, and you've got to find and, and develop a relationship with a partner in the country that you're going to do your work. Um, we have, um, we're run by what I call a working board of directors, and in, uh, if, if, if any of you are, are um, active in, in the nonprofit world, you know that uh, boards of directors can take many forms. Sometimes they are kind of figureheads that are there um, only to raise money. Sometimes they are more actively involved. We have a very actively involved board of directors. Uh, it's not a showy thing at all. Um, almost all the members of the board of directors have either been on trips and volunteered for Missoula Medical Aid, or if when they join the board they haven't, they are actively encouraged and almost always do go on one. So I think that that's an important feature of the way the organization functions, is that boards of directors are actively involved in the volunteer work of the organization as well. Um, I've been on the board of, board of directors of organizations with that, which were volunteer driven, and which I w went ahead and volunteered, but other members of the board didn't, and I think that they miss a lot. Uh, in, in, in not being actively involved. Um, we have three part-time employees, um, but as I say here, we're heavily volunteer driven. We have two part-time employees here in, in uh, Missoula. Uh, you, you may have heard of, of our executive director, David Cates. He's around a lot. Um, 
talking about Missoula Medical Aid. We have an executive director, uh, and then we have a program manager or program director um, who, who does a lot of the support work. David does a lot of the fundraising work. And then we have, um, re within the last year, we have um, employed a representative in Honduras, uh, and that has proved um, invaluable as well. Um, our budget's about $160,000 a year. So you have an idea of what kind of money we're talking about here. And so now, let me talk about what, what I want to do is I want to walk you through one of our trips and say, here's what happens on our trips. Here's what has, to, what has to happen in order for a trip to work. I'll get to this picture in a second here. I'm going to walk you through the trip with, with pictures. And then I'll go back and say, well, what, what do we know on the basis of these trips? What, what, what have we found out? What, what are the issues that have, have arisen? So, um, so how is a trip done? Well, of course, the first step is you have to um, select and structure the team that's going to go on the trip, on the visit. Uh, and that uh, team has to be structured with providers, which are docs, RNs, um, PAs, any, any of a number of professionals that can be providers of medical services. We have translators. We have helpers. We have a, just a certain number of people that help schlepping things around and so forth. Uh, and then, if we, when we have um, a special, a team of specialists that's going to a hospital, for example, uh, we have an extensive orthopedic uh, uh, surgery program in one of the communities where we work. Then you also have OR techs and and, and various other members of that surgical team. And typically, the surgeons put together that team. But there's a trip leader. And there's a, a program director, that's this woman here. Um, and uh, th those two people then assemble that team. And then they start to do a lot of the kind of logistics that have to get done. You've got to buy airline tickets. You've got to arrange documents. You've got to uh, make contact with uh, your partners in Honduras and make sure that they're going to be there at the airport to pick you up and, and do all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of routine log logistics, but it has to get done. Uh, and then, but then the first thing that, the, and then you have a meeting with the team and so forth. But the first thing that has to happen, really, that involves the team is packing up supplies. And that's what this is a scene from a, what we call a packing party, where, uh, where uh, this is in a little storage area we have over at Community Hospital, where we take a lot of the medicines and supplies and so forth that we're going to be using in Honduras with us on the airplane. So it all goes into these kind of plastic boxes. You've probably seen it. Each volunteer on the team, each team member, will take two of those plastic boxes as check-in as check luggage. And that's how we get our stuff there. We, it, it, it all goes kind of free. As a, as a, so, so everybody has 100 pounds of stuff. Team's got about 12 to 20 people in it. So you know, as, as much as. Um, 10,000 pounds of stuff. Um, and uh, it all goes to the airport. And that's what it looks like when, when, the, when we're at the airport. Team meets at the airport, and all of their personal belongings, their clothing, their toiletries, their reading materials, everything that they need for two weeks has to go in their carry-on bags. Uh, because all of their check-in stuff is our stuff, is the, is the group stuff. So, in, in, as you can see from these kind of pictures, the, the, it's important that the team be, you know, ha, have team spirit, mm -hmm. that, it, that it have some solidarity and, and enjoy itself and have a good time. Because the trip's long. You know, we spend a lot of time hanging out in, in airports on the way to Honduras. Um, but, uh, and, and so, you, know, you want the team to be able to enjoy each other's company and have a good time. Eventually, you get to, to Honduras. This is, is Honduras. And we go to one of two places. Either we fly, fly into San Pedro Sula, um, 
and then go and then go by by road to La Esperanza. That's one of the towns that we work out of La Esperanza. Or the other trip, and there's two trips a year that go there. And then one one trip a year we go to we fly to Tegucigalpa and we go down here to San Lorenzo. Just a little bit about then about Honduras and about um, about travel there and about what we encounter. These two cities are among the most dangerous cities in the world uh, in terms of very high levels of crime and violence. Um, they are not safe places. And so one of the responsibilities of Missoula Medical Aid, and if you're going to start your own, you have to think about this, is you, have, you can't guarantee anybody's security, but you, but you do have an obligation to try and minimize the risks that people are associated with. So you don't travel at night. You know? And you try and train people a little bit about what the smart thing to do on the street is and what the not so smart thing to do on the street is. And you don't stay on, you don't go out in, in you don't stay in these communities for very long. Because generally speaking, rural community, rural areas are, La Esperanza and San Lorenzo are safer. Uh, and, just a couple of interesting things about San Pedro Sula here. San Pedro Sula is one of, uh, as I say, it's a very, very dangerous town. It's a lot like Ciudad Juarez on the northern border of Mexico. Um, it's a lot like it in the sense that it is a, it, it is a city that has industrialized rapidly with maquiladoras, which are assembly plants. Um, they, you, they, foreign companies come in, build a factory, and assemble something there. Uh, and uh, workers have gone from all over Honduras to San Pedro Sula for those employment opportunities because Honduras is a very poor country with very uh, uh, limited um, employment opportunities uh, in rural areas. And so what you get is a big influx of people in, into a city where there's there's no roots, there's no community, there's there's very little to um, to to um, there's, there's 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 very little in the way of family life, of family connections, and so they're very they're they're dangerous and insecure places. A lot like as I say, Ciudad Juarez, which is just right across the the river from El Paso, Texas. Um, the interesting thing about San Tegucigalpa is, of course, uh, also a, a big capital city, sprawling on, on the hills. The interesting thing about this area down here in San Lorenzo is, if you could, if you see it, if you're if you're here in San Lorenzo and you go up to the top of the only like five-story building in town, you look to your left, and there's El Salvador, and you look to your right. And there's Nicaragua. And this area here is called the Gulf of Fonseca. And this area was a hotbed of US counterinsurgency during the 1980s. You may remember the famous contras that, um, fought, uh, that fought against the Sandinista regime in Nicaragua that were based in Honduras. and. He conducted operations across the border into Nicaragua. Uh, there was also uh, an insurgency in El Salvador. And there was a lot of movement between Nicaragua and El Salvador across the Gulf of Fonseca. Uh, and uh, the United States Navy mined the Gulf of Fonseca to try and uh, suppress some of that activity. Uh, if you there's a little island here called Amapala. If you climb to the top of that, of an old extinct volcano there, you can see helicopter pads and, 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 and buildings that were occupied by the CIA um, conducting operations with the blessings of a military dictatorship in, in Honduras at the time, conducting operations both in El Salvador and Nicaragua. You, you may remember the famous Molly North case. Uh, oh, the Iran-Contra affair, where North um, was supplying, um, obtaining weapons from from Iran and, and, used, and supplying them to the Contras in Nicaragua. 
I think that, that, that's relevant, I think, because uh, my, my impression is that the people in the San Lorenzo area, I mean, one of their, their, maybe some of their most vivid memories of what Americans are, are military and the CIA. Um, and I have a sense, although I can't prove it, that it colors their response to us when we're there. So we're met um, by, at the airport by um, Save the Children. That's our principal partner uh, in Honduras. And so we're met there and uh, driven off to wherever it is we're going. This happens to be uh, San Pedro Sula. Um, this is, uh, you, we may end up down in San Lorenzo. That's down the Gulf of Fonseca. Makes it look pretty nice, doesn't it? Kind of this tropical paradise kind of a looking place. These, this is actually a mangrove swamp here. Uh, so it's not quite as nice as it looks. Uh, and then, so we might end up there. Or um, this is the Save the Children office. We, we stay at the Save the Children office in a mountainous area near uh, the El Salvador border. Uh, in the state of Itibuca, uh, La Esperanza Itibuca. And uh, right away, I mean, you, we arrive, and right away, the first thing to do is to start unpacking all that stuff that we packed up in the basement at, uh, at Community Health Center. And, and this is the, the room. You can see these are cots. And this is a kind of a dark picture, but these are cots. This is the room where we sleep. And you know we store our medicines and all that kind of stuff. So they're unpacking um, medicine, medicines that we're going to be using. Uh, and then the whole team kind of sits around and packs those medicines, distributes those medicines into little plastic bags, so that we have a, we get big bottles and we d divide it up into little plastic bags, so that we'll have it ready for the next day when we uh, head out to one of these local communities. So that means getting in um, the back of a pickup truck, have to take the water and, and uh, all the supplies and everything, load them in the back of Save the Children pickup trucks. Uh, David Cates always has to smoke a cigar when he's in uh, Honduras for some reason. Uh, I don't think he ever does it anywhere else, but when he's in Honduras, he smokes cigars. And then you uh, ride out to some little community. This is a, this uh, little community here is called uh, Candelaria. This uh, church is a kind of remarkable place because it, I, I haven't ever seen any community that has put as much effort, and they're still putting it in, to constructing such a monumental church uh, as this community for some reason decided to do. So the church is unusual. and the condition of the road is unusual and that it's unusually good. Um, generally speaking, the roads uh, at, are, are very bad, particularly in the rainy season, they, they wash out. So we uh, unload the trucks. This is at the, at the school at La Candelaria. And whoops, got to go backward. Uh, so what we do is um, we set up our, uh, a little <coughs> clinic typically in a school room, like this one here. Uh, and uh, you just you know, set up little uh, s stands with, with school desks. You spend the whole day sitting in a chair about this big off, high off the ground. Uh, and um, local uh, leaders come in and help out. This guy is, is doing that. And, uh, and you get the drugs all medicines all distributed out and so forth. And then you spend the day seeing people, uh, doing basic health exams for families, it's mostly women and children. And we see a whole huge range of complaints. We can see anything from really routine things that most of us would consider not that we really wouldn't need to go to a doctor for, you know, you have headaches or backaches or, or whatever, lots of 
of things associated with how hard people work uh, in these areas, um, to um, more serious, um, sometimes extremely serious chronic conditions, about which, of course, we can't do anything immediately. Um, and then, uh, so, so we see a, a, a wide range of things. But basically, what we're doing here is providing health screenings. We see lots of kids, mothers will come in with lots of kids with say, ear infections and, and things of that sort. So we'll give them penicillin or we'll give them um, various kinds of, um, mostly off the, over, over the counter uh, medications, but, but some, but we, but we take a lot of that are not. Lots of uh, intestinal parasites that we treat. Um, in this area, we encountered originally lots of lung problems. Uh, and I'll talk about that and why that happened a little bit more later on. Uh, but that's basically what happens. And it goes on all day. Um, and there's you know, help. Uh, the conditions, as you can imagine, are you know, a little basic. And uh, you know, be a dog or a chicken or something like that walking around that's par for the course. There's a women's clinic that does PAP um, tests. Um, and uh, those tests then are sent to, the, uh, to a lab in Tegucigalpa. And a follow up on that has to be done then if there's an abnormal PAP test. The follow-up has to be done by Save the Children. Has to go back out to these communities and find the the, the woman whose had test was abnormal and get her to the doctor. Um, lots of kids around, always, of course. Kid, kids swarming all over the place. A lot of fun. This picture I I wanted to show you because this is one of the things that kind of really impressed me. When I, when, I, when I first went to Honduras, I had been a Peace Corps volunteer, as Peter said, back in the 60s in Colombia. And, you know, you, you look at this house, and this house is this building, whatever it is, you know, with the chicken coming in and out, and the dog going, about to go in and out. That's a lot like Colombia was 50 years ago. Not a lot of difference. Looks a lot the same. But this, is different. That means that at this place, they're selling cell phone cards. Everybody has a cell phone. Everybody has a cell phone. Cell phones are dirt cheap. They're ridiculously cheap. And you can go and get a little card and put some time on your phone. Like uh, 100 Lempitas, like $2.50. And, 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 and then you'll be able to talk on your phone. And they're ubiquitous, and they're all over the place, and they're out in the countryside. It's uh, a world away in terms of communication from, uh, from what, uh, what I saw, for example, in a house like this 50 years ago in Columbus. Um, it's, it's also interesting, you, you may have, um, have heard about um, I'm going to block on his name, um, Muhammad, uh, micro capital guy. Oh, the Grameen Bank guy? Yeah, the Grameen Bank guy. You may have heard about how he financed cell phones for Yunus. Yeah, Muhammad Yunus. Uh, how he financed cell phones um, as, as to allow people to give somebody an, op an economic opportunity in a little village, you, know, you finance the cell phone. Uh, that, that, that's not a business anymore. You can't do that anymore. These things are so cheap and so available that if, if, you, if you said, I'm going to get a cell phone so that I can charge people to use my cell phone, they would just laugh at you. Mm -hmm. you it can't happen anymore. It's a, it's, a, it's a really different world in that respect. So sometime during the day, you have a lunch, of course. Uh, and then it's back. Uh, this is back at the, at the Save the Children headquarters where people are safe. But you're still kind of front and center. You know, there's 
I, you, the, the day, although you're back uh, from the day out at one of these little communities, you're still um, entertaining kids that are wandering by, uh, or maybe you're dancing. This is a people, you know, this people try to have fun on these trips, obviously, uh, and you know, they try to maintain contact with other folks and have and have a good time. And so these guys are dancing. Nunca arriba, nunca abajo, siempre al lado means never above, never below, always side by side, um, which is expresses um, Zulu Medical Aid's philosophy with respect to how we deal with people, always side by side. Um, at the same time that all that's going on, then there are these uh, teams of specialists working in the hospitals. Uh, and in San Lorenzo, um, they work in obstetrics. Uh, these are a couple of, uh, this is a, 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 an MMA uh, nurse with a uh, Honduran nurse and the, the newborns. And then in, uh, uh, in, in uh, La Esperanza, as I said before, we have a pretty well established orthopedic surgery um, program. This is Andy Puckett. Some of you may have been treated by him. Um, I hope not. <laughs> it's usually something has had bad has happened to your hand when it when when he does. But uh, he has gone on many of our trips. Um, these guys are get up at seven in the morning on the first day that they're in Honduras, and they get back to the save the children compound about ten at night, and they just get it. Hard. And so uh, they they see patients. Um, oops, I'm trying to use the pointer to change the slide. Uh, they uh, prepare them for surgery. They do surgeries all day long. Um, they they'll, they they'll do uh, many many surgeries over the course of the week that they're there. You usually stay one week. Um, this whole team comes as a team from Missoula. Uh, there's it's Andy checking out a patient after the operation. And uh, we have, uh, in fact, in, in uh, La Esperanza, sufficiently well-established orthopedic uh, program orthopedic surgery program that we we built this shed simply to so store orthopedic supplies. So that's all all that that is. So we don't have to drag that stuff back and forth from Missoula all the time. The other things that we're doing, um, the other things that that get done during the trip is that we visit the various kinds of projects that we have supported uh, in the past that are not necessarily medical. So this is um, um, a sustainable agricultural um, operation that um, that we that we helped develop. Um, this this picture I, I I include this picture because it it refers back to something I talked about earlier. Lots of people cook inside their house on an open fire, little clay <coughs> fireplace with a, but an open fire inside a house. Uh, and that was responsible for a lot of lung problems. Because people were breathing lots of smoke inside their house. And so one of the projects that we got involved with was building chimneys for these in indoor stoves. It was a simple process of installing a, 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 like a little hood in a chimney uh, in the house to, to um, evacuate the smoke. Uh, and so here's a here's a, uh, a, a another clay stove, but then it has the chimney there. And the other thing about this picture is that this woman is 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 a mother in another program that we support, which is early childhood nutrition and stimulation. So this is for preschool kids, um, and parents come. They 
they uh, plant and maintain gardens in order to provide food for, uh, to, in order to provide at least one meal, a uh, good meal a day for preschoolers, and also to provide them with some kind of preschool stimulation. So there's, this is one of their lunches, there's kids, you know, chowing down. That's the playground outside. But these are facilities that, I don't know, maybe they look pretty simple to us, and, but um, these kids uh, are living in a very, very impoverished environment. Uh, and so uh, this program is intended to provide them with uh, stimulation, uh, nutrition, and so forth. We uh, have supported the purchase of corn mills to grind corn uh, for local use or for sale. And then uh, we, we do a number of other things, and I'll, get, and I'll, and I'll mention those in, in, in a bit. But uh, we also, if we're there for two weeks, we, we have a weekend where there's some, a little bit of R&R. &R. Uh, people are pretty much exhausted after a week. And so this is, a, this is a, just a group taking a walk on that Amapala Island, the one where the CIA once, once occupied. Uh, and that volcano there is in El Salvador. It's the Gulf of Fonseca. Or people go to the Mayan ruins at Copan. Um, also just to relax a little and to contemplate the splendor of the, of the ruins of Copan, which really are quite remarkable. And then it's over. Okay. So we're back at the airport going home. OK. So that's a trip. Uh, you know, there's lots of details that I left out because I couldn't find the right picture. Uh, but uh, that, that's, that's basically what our trip our trips are like, and so what I want to talk about now is, well, how do you, what do you have to do to make this all happen? What are some of the issues that you face and so forth? So I'm going to start with money, because I'm an economist, so naturally I'm going to say, what's, what do you have, but of course you have to have money. I already said you have to have $160,000. Where do you get money? Well, we get it in two places. We get it, uh, first of all, volunteers have to cover almost all of the cost of their own trip. They have to raise, through contributions to MMA, almost the entire cost of their own trip. 1,200 bucks uh, is, is what volunteers are expected to raise, and that covers most of the cost. So uh, that's one important source. And I think that tells you something about the degree of commitment that you have to get from volunteers. Because you're not only asking people to spend two weeks in Honduras and sometimes give up two weeks of wages or two weeks of the fees that they could normally be collecting or whatever, but you're also asking them, to, and, and, and also you're asking them to step into a fairly, you know, to a, into a somewhat uh, insecure and definitely uncomfortable situation. But you're also asking them to raise $1,200 to go out and hit up their friends for $1,200. So the commitment is significant. Uh, it's, it's not, it's, and, and I think, by the way, that most organizations that do this kind of thing have the same requirement. I think that's pretty typical, that you get volunteers to raise the money to, to to, to do what it is that they're going to do. The other thing that we do, well, we raise money, as, as, as always, of course, we raise money from selected donors who are willing to give substantial amounts. Okay. But the other thing we do is we have local events. And one of the, one of the local events that's, re that's really very important for us, that we, we, we raise $50,000, is a salsa bowl that we have every year. You all have to come on November. Uh, it's, it's called the Legendary Salsa Bowl. And uh, we have an auction and do all kinds of things to raise money at it. But um, that's another area where the community, I think, 
that, that makes us distinctive is that we raise most of the money that we raise right here. We raise most of the money to make all this happen by volunteers going to their friends and neighbors and family or by uh, raising money at a ball, at a dance. I mean, that's, between those two, we raise, you know, the majority of the money that we, that we fund. So that's the nature of the community, um, the, the community basis. And, I'm, and there's something else about that community basis that I want to talk about, which is that um, I think we all, be, we all believe, and, and, and I believe certainly, that the community of Missoula benefits. This is not, it's not just all the dollars going out. But I think that the community of Missoula benefits from Missoula Medical Aid by giving people in the community the opportunity to come to know and to work and to understand a situation that otherwise would be inaccessible to them. Uh, this is, for me, particularly true when we're able to take, which we have, which we occasionally do, high school students with us as helpers or whatever. To be able to, I mean, for a high school student to end up working in a medical clinic in a, in a remote rural village in Honduras is really a remarkable experience. Uh, and I think, uh, but even for every, for every, for all the adults uh, that go along, I think it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an opportunity for them and a way in which they can potentially enrich this community as well. So, Missoula pays us to go, pays for us, for us to go, but I think the community gets something back from us. My, my own involvement, um, one, of, one of the things that's been nice for me as, in, in, in this involvement is, I, you know, as I, I was a Peace Corps volunteer, as I said, and when I looked at that, those houses and went, went into these communities, it felt like I was going home. I mean, it felt just like it felt 50 years ago. Uh, and yet, that meant that I, as a, say, as a trip leader, could give my fellow Missoulas, my, fe my friends and fellow citizens from Missoula, the opportunity. I could, I could, I could break the ice. I could, I could make them feel confident about being in the situation where otherwise they probably wouldn't feel too, too confident about being in. But that raises a really interesting question. And it's a question that I think comes up every single trip. Every single trip at dinner time, when we're sitting around and we're having dinner and we're drinking beers, this question arises. And that is, what are we accomplishing? What does this all mean? Now, some of it is pretty straightforward. I mean, it's pretty obvious, for example, that you know, if you um, repair an old arm break, or you do an orthopedic surgery, or you deliver a baby, or you diagnose um, a cancer, or something of that sort, it's pretty obvious that you've done something. But on the other hand, people sit there and they think, well, you know, here we go out to these villages, and we talk to these families, and we talk to these, look at these kids, and Look at their moms and dads, and okay, we find an infected ear and we give them penicillin. Tomorrow we're not going to be there, and some other kid's going to have an infected ear. Yeah. What lasting impact? How, 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 how can we provide any continuity to the care that we give? What lasting impact can we possibly have? Are we just doing this to make ourselves feel good? Are we just doing this because we feel good about it? We go back to Missoula, we give lectures and show pictures? Or, 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 or can we really do something that has some kind of sustainability? And this might be the right word for it. Now, it's easy when this topic inevitably arises 
It's easy to throw up your hands and say, well, you know, it really takes fundamental social change. We gotta have a revolution. We gotta have radical change in the social system in order to solve these problems. And of course, to some degree, that's true. But, you know, that's not on the agenda. You don't get to do that in a, in a two week visit from, with Missoula Medical Aid. You're not going to restructure the economic system. You're not going to get rid of corrupt government. You're not going to break the grip of the armed forces on the state apparatus. You're not going to do those things. So what, we'll do, what do we do? What are the kinds of responses that we have tried to make to assure that we're not just, well, I'm going to use the phrase that people use. It's very impolite, but I'm going to use it anyway. We're not just pissing in the wind. So what do we do? Well, as I said before, one of the things that we can do is that can have a lasting impact and sustainable impact is the specialized teams. Uh, another thing that we do, and this, this is important and also very problematic, is that we do referrals and we leave money for referrals so that when we find a patient who needs a, a, additional treatment, there is a public hospital system in Honduras and uh, which can provide uh, for a variety of specialized diagnostics, specialized treatments, and so forth. Um, and we can refer to the patients to that system. And we leave money behind with Save the Children to help people get to that, those services that we've referred them to. So that's a way that we can extend our impact beyond just blowing into a village and blowing out in the evening. The problem with that is multifold. The problems with that are multifold. One problem is that the flow of information about where these services are really available is not very good. We oftentimes learn only at the very last moment that some, somebody's going to be available to be able to provide this service. Uh, so we don't, have, we don't have good information about that. And what happens also to folks is that, yes, you can get some kind of a surgery you need, but you can't get the hospital bed. You can get the surgery for free, but you've got to pay for the hospital bed. And your family has to go out and buy the medicine. On, at the pharmacy outside the hospital. Um, or maybe you'll get to the hospital and they say, well, yeah, we can do that surgery, but you've got to come back in a few months. Or a, a variety of things go wrong. And one of the things that we have struggled with is to try and find out when is it working and when is it not working. Because what we have found is we go back to the same community and we say, oh, you. Didn't we send you to uh, uh, Tegucigalpa for cataract surgery? Yeah, but uh, it didn't happen. Couldn't make it happen. Couldn't afford it. Hospital turned me away. Something like that happened. Every once in a while, <laughs> you're really lucky. You, so you, you got a guy, terrible cataract. And you say, where, where can we send this guy? And it saves the children. People say, oh, send him to the Cubans. Well, what Cubans? Oh, there's, there's a Cuban ophthalmologist in the hospital at such and such a place. Uh, and what they'll do is they'll take him and send him to, to Tegucigalpa and put him on an airplane and fly him to Havana and do uh, uh, cataract surgery on him and fly him back and send him home. Wow. Hell of a deal. But you never know. So that, that the problem of referrals and following up on referrals and making sure that referrals work and, and having the money for them is, is a serious one. 
The other thing that we try and do is we try to underlie, address some of the underlying problems of, of bad health. Uh, that would be an example of the nutrition program that we support, the chimney program um, that we support. We, um, for a while, sent dentists, and sometimes still do, but we decided it was really better to simply send money to fund ongoing dental and vision services um, with Honduran providers. So we, we, we hire a dentist, a uh, part-time dentist that works in the Lions Club in La Esperanza, and we pay, we pay for that service. Because it's, as it turns out, we have much more continuity, and we have, it's, it's in, in essence, cheaper and more effective to send the money rather than to send the dentist. Um, we try to promote um, stronger rural economies. We try to provide medicines to th in these communities, as I, as I mentioned before, to, to um, trained healthcare workers, school principals. We give every school we go to, we, we, we take fluoride. Uh, so that the kids can get fluoride treatments for their teeth um, a couple times a year. Um, we support health education. We, we pay the tuition of nursing students. Um, and in working with um, Save the Children, we are a part of, a, of an extensive suite of activities that Save the Children um, has. You may have, at least some of the more senior members of the audience, may remember the old days when Save the Children ads were where you, you sent a check to help some particular little kid. Um, Save the Children now is a community development NGO uh, with a wide range of programs including health care, family planning, education, sanitation, um, everything you can imagine. Uh, and so we are work with them, and we are part of that suite of, of activities that, that they uh, have going on in the communities where we, where we work. And that leads me, I guess, to the last point I want to make here, and that is about the importance of partner organizations. Um, we would not be able to do what we do without Save the Children. I mean, they provide all kinds of stuff to us. They provide technical and professional support. They have uh, ag technicians, teachers, nurses, uh, accountants, and so forth. They provide administration. They can provide community development programs. They, they help us manage referrals. They are, they are the, the entity that does all our logistics when we're, when we're in the country. Yeah. I mean, they transport us. They, you know, they see that we're fed. Everything, every, every logistical problem that you can imagine about having a team of people from Missoula in Honduras, in a rural area of Honduras for two weeks, every logistical problem that you can imagine, they're the ones that solve, every single one. And you know, we, we, I don't know where we would begin if we had to do the stuff that they do for us. Obviously, uh, we have an important partnership with the regional hospitals, particularly in uh, La Esperanza and the, uh, the uh, orthopedic surgery program. We have, they, they, they accumulate patients in the, in our absence, they queue them up, they evaluate them, they do the follow-up, it's, it's, it's important. Um, our vision and, and dental programs um, are closely aligned with the Lions Club um, in La Esperanza, another important partnership. We have in the past had partnerships with the Peace Corps, uh, who helped us as um, they did some, some kind of rural health promotion, but also did, did translation with us, supplied us with translators. But Peace Corps has been uh, taken out of Honduras for reasons of security. 
Um, we have, have local high school students help us out. We have schools and community leaders. We have the Cubans, occasionally. You, you never know when the Cubans are going to be there, what they're going to be doing, or whatever, but you know, when they're there, they're there. Um, Cuba uh, has a national, has one of the highest rates on a per capita basis of medical school graduation in the world, if not the highest. And they send doctors everywhere around, well, every, I, I think to Africa, but certainly around Latin America. Uh, so so, so um, you run into Cubans all the time. But the one relationship that we don't have is with government. There doesn't appear to be um, much interest. Occasionally, a local government will show some interest in, in what we're doing. But, but generally speaking, there's not, not much of a relationship with government. So that's, those are some of the issues um, that I think um, arise. Um, in, in putting together a program of this kind. And um, I guess I'll stop there and see if you have any questions. Do you foresee any changes with community community clinic in the future with the support that you get for <laughs> Funny you should ask. Yeah, we just lost our space in community. Um, in fact, if anybody has any safe um, storage space. Uh, well, we're, we're looking for it uh, right now. I, we think we found some, but um, because they're moving in some, our storage space was in the basement of one of the, of, of, of the one of those buildings directly to the south of the hospital. And um, I think they're moving additional docks in there that move, need that space. And so um, they said, we, can't have it. But we we're used to do. We we've been in a number of places over the years that were. I mean, we have a certain amount of stuff, but we can get a group of people together and move if we can find a place to move to fairly easily. What about donations? Do they, do they donate a bunch of the stuff? Or I beg your pardon. What about donations through them? Uh, we we do get donations of supplies from both hospitals. And uh, the Providence, for a while, was also s supporting volunteer medical staff to go as volunteers. That is, they would pay for people to go. Um, I understand that they have suspended that now because they have their own Providence-based outreach thing going on. We do get donations of of uh, medicines uh, from hospitals and also from drug companies and, and so on. Yeah. Um, so I have a question. I think two questions in this should have brought So you've been operating for uh, you know, quite a few years and you've said you served quite a few people in the community and so you said one relationship that you don't really have with the government. So I guess with um, you know you coming in and providing the service, what is the government to kind of um, increase health care delivery or health care workers as such if, if NGOs are coming in and providing those services. So do you see that um, as an issue, as, as a limitation for the government to be incented to kind of provide better health care access to the system? Um, it, it certainly could be. My, my my, sen my 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 sense is that the larger constraint for government in terms of providing health care is probably budgetary, um, financial. Um, when I was talking about relationships with the government, however, I was thinking more in terms of whether local government wanted to do anything, local governments or wanted to do anything to support our work uh, in terms of almost anything logistical. Uh, and they, they, it, as I say, occasionally a, a mayor or somebody will say, oh, thank you for coming out. This is great. You're doing this. And, um, and, and we'll be supportive in that respect. But that's 
the exception rather than the rule. So I, I'd like to say a few things here too. And um, you know, I really appreciate the uh, fact that you, two things. I, I love the way you work through the whole process from when you get started and when you get to the airport and all the way there and back. I thought that was really great. It gave us a, a hands-on understanding of how a mission like this works. I also like the way you were willing to be reflective and, you know, even to some extent self-critical about um, the role of Missoula Medical Aid. Um, and I think that's important, so I want to kind of push that a little further. Um, so, you know, I think the issue of evaluation is really extremely important in terms of global health. Um, you know, how do you evaluate impact? We can evaluate outputs, how many people were treated, how many medicines were given, that kind of thing. But what impact does it have in the long run? I think that was the, that's the issue that, uh, that you're struggling with. I don't think there's any really easy answers to that question. In fact, I think most of the people <coughs> today who really do evaluation work are more likely to focus on outcomes and impact. So when they talk about outcomes, they're really talking about capacity. What kind of capacity did you develop? That's a little easier to get a handle on than impacts. So I, just as an aside, uh, on Friday this week um, at noon, um, a uh, expert on evaluation, in fact, he is the head of the evalu independent evaluation unit for the Global Environmental Fund, the World Bank's money lending and, and operation for things like environmental uh, improvements around the world, is going to be here on campus and give a lecture on evaluating World Bank programs and so forth. Uh, that's 12 o'clock in the, um, where is it? Uh, Honor. The Honors College, right, uh, in the Honors College. Um, and so I encourage you to come if you're interested in that question and, and hear what Yuha Wito has to say. But my, my thinking is that, and you know, so tell me if I'm wrong here, Dick. I think that what Missoula Medical Aid needs is an exit strategy. So you know, you talked about all those other things you do. I think those are all important. Uh, but where is the exit strategy? And exit strategies, it seems to me, really rely heavily on training. Now I know it's true that funding has got to be there too. But I think that you know, where is the training part? That's what I think some of the talks we've had over the course of this semester have looked at that kind of dimension of things. How can we how can we get out and leave the situation behind so that people can carry on without us? Right. Uh, well, those are, let, let me go back to evaluation for just a second. Um, um, and, and whether you're right that evaluation is difficult, particularly if you're trying to determine whether or not there has been um, some um, significant and permanent change in health status in the population. Um, just getting the data for that um, it, it, it is very hard. Uh, and we, uh, one of the things that we do try to do at least is follow up with pa patients who, who we see, who we know require further care, we refer, we do try to, to, to see whether that, that has happened. Um, and I just wanted to say with respect to evaluation, one of the interesting things that, that happens in the Rural Institute here on campus is evaluation of, of, of health programs. Um, very, very rigorous and formal evaluation of health programs for various kinds of outcomes. Um, I'm, I'm using outcomes in the same way you're using impacts, I think, but outcomes in terms of of impacts on uh, health conditions, uh, use of the healthcare system, economic uh, viability, and so forth. Uh, okay, now on, on the exit strategy and the training piece, um, as I say, I mean, part of the, our exit strategy has been to say, well, in, in, in the instances where the resources are there, for example, in vision and dental and so forth, we will um, we will withdraw. We'll, we'll say um, 
we'll, we'll continue to help support those services, but we're not going to, to try and provide them. There's a perfectly adequate uh, basis for doing it. Um, perfectly adequate resources for doing it there. Um, we have done some, have, have had some effects, attempts at training people in village, in these kind of rural communities that, that, that we go to in, you know, some basic health practices and uh, first aid and that kind of thing. Um, and then, of course, we supported students who are going to go to like a nursing school and then come back and work in those communities. But and we've talked about that, about training as as important. My 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 sense about the exit strategy is that I mean, you you should be successful enough that you're not needed again. Uh, I mean that that. That's true, and, and and not only that, but you you know you should be efficient. There's no reason to send a troop of Missoulians to rural Honduras to do something that rural Hondurans can do for themselves if only they get a min, min, minimum amount of material support for doing it. There's almost no reason, except. Um, that in, in many respects, I think that one of the kind of the soul of Zula Medical Aid does involve the relationship between communities. I mean, and there, there is that piece there. Um, you know, if all Missoula Medical Aid was, was a, a uh, organization that raised money to support these activities in Honduras carried out by Hondurans. That might be the more efficient thing, but I think the organization at that point <laughs> sort of becomes sort of a shadow of its former self. Uh, and maybe that's self-indulgent, I don't know. Well, you could move on to, it's not to say you have to exit the whole country, you could move on from one well, village to another. I, I should say that, that although we go to the same um, Two cities, the, the the villages that we visit change over time. So we're not we haven't been going back to the same places for for uh, what 15 years. Uh, that that does change. Well, and as I say, it's carried out in conjunction with the Save the Children programs in those villages. Well, this brings us to the conclusion of this uh, year's lecture series. And, uh, you know, I'd like to think that the, over the course of the lectures, and I know that many of you have been here for all of them, um, you get some sense of why I thought it was important to have this lecture series. And the reason basically is because I wanted to showcase the kinds of commitment, the kinds of really amazing things that people in this community of Missoula, and you know, as far as we went to Kalispell and Livingston, but people in Montana are doing around the world. And you know, I think that this uh, description of Missoula Medical Aid, who's been doing this kind of thing now for what you say, 15 years since '98, since '98, so, is is really a very good example of that. Just but one of many. And so, on behalf of all of these speakers that came and talked to us for this entire lecture series. Let's give Dick a really loud round of applause for the work of medical. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you can find us on Google us, find us on Facebook. You can read a lot more about us, see a lot more pictures. Uh, and remember the salsa bowl. <laughs>